Hello everybody, my name is John Purrier and I'm with John Purrier EMSCE. Uh, today I just wanted to be able to do a PowerPoint lesson that is test taking strategies. And it is a free lecture that's here on my website for anybody to be able to watch and learn from. A lot of people have uh, told me that my prep courses and refresher courses are really good in teaching the information of medics scope of practice and helping them understand how to take care of their patients and all of the the national curriculum scope of practice all of that stuff but they need something to be able to help them take a test so they're like you know what I know the information now because I have taken your prep classes I've taken your refreshers but I'm still having an issue with passing this written exam. All right, well, let's go over how to take a test. And please feel free to share this with your friends, uh, other students, coworkers, whoever needs this class because it is free. The information that I have received this PowerPoint from was found on the internet and there is no copyright infringements that I know of. It was free access and I am going to use that because it is from an educator that is truly just trying to help their students pass an exam when they know the information and they just have some trouble in being able to pass the exam. So this is truly how to strategically answer multiple choice questions, but then also we'll go into true, false, and fill in the blank, and multiple choice, you know, just many, many types of questions. So we're going to go right on into this, and what I want you to know that the goal of this presentation is to provide students with strategies on how to prepare for exams and how to strategically answer multiple choice questions. Because that's usually what the National Registry written exam is. So it all has to do, you know, you want to improve your performance on examinations. So you need to prepare for the exams. You know, you need to study. You need to take uh, test taking tips. You definitely need to know your knowledge of the information. Then also strategically analyze multiple choice questions and then prepare for the exam itself. And it's really, you know, not getting into that panic stage. You know, that's the big thing. Everybody talks about how when they go to take the test they just flat panic so we don't want that so test taking strategies you take a good prep class hint 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 I do offer 16 hour prep classes for EMTs and paramedics and uh, first responders and also advanced can take those courses as well so then also get yourself a, a good book or a good online resource that helps you take practice, uh, practice exams. Schedule your exam as soon as possible after you complete this prep course. So I always tell my students that if you're taking my 16 hour online recorded or an on-site live or even an online live class that you need to have your test scheduled as soon after your class is over. So that way all the information is on the top of your head, top of your brain, right there at your memory so when you see something then you already know the information. So I want to review multiple choice questions, true false tests, matching test, and then also completion test where you have to fill in the blank. So I want you to see on study tips here that study tips, actively uh, an active study flow diagram. This is active study techniques, okay? So you are going to pre-read your text. 
you're going to go to your classes and in your classes you're going to take notes and you're going to ask questions of your instructor. If you truly don't understand something then talk to your instructor. I mean my gosh if you don't have an instructor to talk to and you need one well then email me text me call me you know I'll be your instructor I'll help you no matter what class you have taken because that is my goal that is my passion is truly helping people so you review and edit notes the same day as the lecture as you have received them you can use note cards flashcards you know I mean just develop a study schedule and then develop study sheets for exams so when you're looking at all of your review uh, editing your notes then ask yourself questions read the text selectively do your homework do your practice exams and ask questions again of your instructors me if you don't understand something and let them help explain it hopefully in a way that you can understand it. Now I want you to understand man I use the KISS principle. I didn't say KISS. It's not K-I-S-S -S, keep it simple stupid. It is K-I-S-P and my principle is keep it simple per year. So you put your own initial on the end of that of your own name and make it your own principle but use mine for right now and just keep it simple per year. So now again you're going to outline your major topics while you're doing all of this and then you're going to review and integrate all of this information now I want to explain the power of panic because a person who panics relies on their instincts instead of their knowledge they also lack an understanding of the exam content. So I don't want you to panic. I need you to just settle down, relax the day before your exam, and feel and understand that you know the information that you're going to be tested on. Now what will happen if you panic? Well, your memory will be inhibited. The ability to focus will decrease you'll tend to overlook the stated facts in the questions you'll easily get confused emotions take precedence over your own reasons and then guessing comes into play and that's just not strategic so panic has a power over people and I'm trying to let you understand that there's nothing to panic over it's just an exam it's trying to test your knowledge and then people are like yeah but John there's questions on this test that words I've never heard of things that I just don't get I mean I've never heard of it I don't understand it they don't give enough information in the test question to be able to help me select the right answer you know there's all kinds of things and yes I understand that but let me explain one thing the test question that you read that's all the information that they want you to have to be able to answer that question and then the answers that they give you there will always be two correct answers that are in a multiple choice test so don't rationalize each question trying to make them correct because you'll find the two correct answers and then you won't be able to find out which one is most correct that that exam wants you to know. So just read the question and only the question. Don't add any information to it. Don't, don't make your own scenario up in the question. And then answer the question in your head from your knowledge and then go find the answer that actually meets the answer that you've picked in your head. Don't panic. Now we've got to do this process of elimination so process of elimination is the most effective way to improve your chances of selecting a correct answer well eliminating incorrect answers 
you know that's what's really important in the very beginning details are important watch the little subtle differences in answers and choices so use question stems to find the key text also answer choices must be logical if reasoning for an answer choice is not correct then the answer is not correct so like the incorrect answers they misrepresent a fact or facts they also ignore the central issue in the question and they have faulty reasoning but correct answers they will state a fact or facts they also address the central issue in the question and they also have sound reason now the process of elimination is the most effective way to improve your choice of chancing, uh, chances of selecting a correct answer. Faulty reasoning includes blatant contraindications, goes beyond the facts that they give you in the question, and it assumes facts in dispute are true. When can a right answer be wrong? Well, when the answer choices include an option that is more correct or a better option. Now, there is a guessing game. And do not guess until you have eliminated all known wrong answers. Look at the facts in the question stem. So what issue or issues stand out? Then look for the answer choice or choices that address the issue or issues presented in the stem question the stem of the question but beware of the following distractors or foils they're incorrect answers that appear to be correct also absolute certainties always never cannot must and if two answers are opposites then one is probably the correct answer. All right, let's look about multiple choice questions. Most commonly used objective test question, and it consists of two parts. There is a stem, which is the statement or the question, and then there are answer choices, and that's known as distractors or foils. Now, multiple choice questions will assess memory of facts, details, and or relationships, and then also the ability to reason. That's a K-type. So you have a synthesis to an analysis to an application. And there's two rules you remember when you're taking multiple choice questions. You need to budget your time wisely because you know that your test has a time limit on it. So make sure that you're taking the appropriate amount of time on each question. And then also relax. Don't panic. So read the question carefully. Now I know it's a computer-based type of, of test. So you can't, you know, write on the computer screen, but in your head, I want you to be able to underline, highlight, or circle important terms in your mind. And then eliminate, eliminate, eliminate. Get rid of the choices that you know are incorrect at your first glance. And doing so will improve your chances of selecting a correct answer. Only change answers if you are absolutely sure that the current answer is incorrect. Do not second guess yourself. You've heard every single instructor that's ever taught you anything. Don't change your answer because you probably have the correct answer and you're second guessing yourself and you're going to pick the answer that is correct, but it's not the most correct choice. You've selected the correct answer, so leave it alone. So only change your answer if you are absolutely sure you have picked the incorrect answer. Again, use your time wisely. Don't, you know, you've got to pace yourself. Browse, test, and determine the time to spend on each question. Don't ignore an obvious answer. And avoid patterns, kind of like selecting C 
just because every instructor says that if you don't know the answer just select C because statistics show that <clears throat> it's probably going to be C. No, that's really not true. Not on my test, it's not, just for that very reason. So here's a multiple choice question, a type A question. It deals with basic knowledge, factual information, and it requires knowledge of the information. This is the simplest type of multiple choice question. So an example, what most frequently causes a tennis player to miss the ball completely? There is swinging too early, swinging too late, not watching the ball, gripping the bracket incorrectly. Well, the answer is C, not watching the ball. All right, here's another one. Type B question focuses on application. These questions test knowledge in a specific content and requires more than just memorization. So an example would be, Billy, at the age of two months, is a very active and, very, and wiggles frequently. The findings of a study on the origins of temperamental or constitutional personality differences would predict that. Billy will be very quiet and docile by age five. Billy will succeed in school. Billy will very likely be active and unable to sit still for long as a small child. And Billy would be neurotic. So we got to look at how would we analyze this question? Okay, let's look at the question again. Okay, now here's my points. First off, step one is identify the key words in the question's stem. The stem of this question is origins of temperamental or constitutional personality differences. That's the stem of the question. Then step two, you might ask yourself, what symptoms of the disorder appeared in this study? Well, step three, this question requires you to recall definitions and how to visualize how definitions can be applied in real life. That's what this is doing. So the answer is C. The study actually showed that Billy will be likely, uh, likely be active and unable to sit for long as a small child. All right, here is a type C multiple choice question or a K-type, and that requires analysis, synthesis, and evaluation in order to select an answer. K-type questions require integ integration of knowledge and decision making. So you really have to know your stuff on this kind of a question. Let me give you an example. A student suffers from an injured ankle while running at first base in a softball game. The teacher examines the indicated area. The symptoms are typical of a sprained ankle, although the injury may, in fact, be more severe. Which of the following steps should be included in the first aid administered to the student? So we've got three choices. We've got elevate the injured leg, apply ice to the injured area, and or apply direct pressure to the site of injury. And then it's got the selections. You've got one only, two only, one and two only, one and three only. Okay, let's examine how to evaluate this. Step one, read the stem carefully and identify the key words in the question stem. So here it is. There is an injured ankle, typical of a sprained ankle, although the injury may in fact be more severe that's what we're looking at. But step two, you might ask yourself, if the injury is more severe, then what other conditions could apply? But step three, although the stem implies that the injury may be more serious, it's not definitely stated. Therefore, the first aid administration should be based on a sprained ankle, not anything more severe than that. So the answer is actually C. It is one and two only. 
you would not apply direct pressure over the site of the injury because it may be that way. Now we're only going to do what is shown to us. So you look at the type of multiple choice questions. The type of question, one, complete the statement. That's given an incomplete statement that must be completed with an answer. So strategies to approach that, that type of question, carefully read the question stem, eliminate wrong answers immediately, read the question stem with each answer, make sure your answer choice best completes the sentence. Now, which of the following type of questions? There's a choice of answers limited to answer stem only, although others' answers could apply which aren't listed. So strategies to approach that type of question? Carefully read the question stem. Insert the answer choices in place of the phrase, which of the following? And then another type of question are negative choices. It is not, except, least, and these words are often overlooked. Negative choices are used for questions with several good solutions, but there is clearly a wrong answer in the choices. So strategies to approach this type of question is to carefully read the question stem, underline, circle, or highlight the negative word presented in the stem so that you will select a correct answer. Think about what choice doesn't fit. Keep in mind that you're looking for a negative choice, one that does not belong. So these type of questions are really hard for students because they overlook the not, the except, or all of the following except that you look, you don't see that. And you're just trying to say, okay, what fits this? And then you find three that fit it, and there's one that doesn't. Well, guess what? In the question, it's saying except, so the one that doesn't fit, that is your answer. Okay? So please don't overlook that. Now, weeding out absolute words. Try to do that in your question. And then, recognizing umbrella or fusion type of questions. So an umbrella question, also known as a fusion question, seems to have four correct answers. So it's like, which of the following is a part of a car? And then you have oil filter, engine, carburetor, and air filter. Okay, well, the correct answer is B, engine. You know, you probably notice that all of the other choices look like good answers. And that's a clue that you have an umbrella or a fusion question. The clue that the three of the answers fit within the category of the fourth. In this case, in this question, the carburetor, the air filter, and the oil filter, are all they're all parts of the engine. So engine is the correct answer. You may also notice that engine is a more general term than the others. Okay, let's look at another one. This is more medical. Which of the following is a part of the human leg? And then you've got the answers, the femur, the thigh, the quadriceps, the hamstrings. And right away, you probably recognize that they are all part of the leg. So, how do you decide? Again, this is an example of another type of fusion question or an umbrella question. So, what would be the answer? The answer is B, the thigh, because all the others are part of the thigh, which again is also the most general of the terms. Okay, here's another one. Which of the following is found in the United States? Then you've got Richmond, Roanoke, Lynchburg, and Virginia. Okay, what do you notice about that really quickly? Well, you probably got this one right. It's D, Virginia, because all of the others are cities located in Virginia. 
So now you look at absolute words. That's another obstacle to taking a multiple choice test. It's, it's when absolute words appear in the choices. At the right over there is a list of some of the absolute words, and these are usually make a sentence false. So absolute, absolute words would be none, never, all, always, every day, only, must. Those are very, very strong words. Even in conversation with somebody like your spouse or a loved one, when, you know, you would get pretty upset if all of a sudden your spouse says, you always do whatever. You never Hmm. Those are strong words, my friend. Don't use them in your communication, in your relationship. <laughs> All right, so here's an example. The result of Barney's study showed that A, all people suffer from SPAK. No people suffer from SPAK. SPAK never occurs in young people. And SPAK may be found more in older people. So did you notice that choices one, two, and three contained the absolute words all, no, and never? In general, absolute words limit too many options to be good choices for an answer. The correct choice, however, was more general. It, can turn, it contained the word may. That's what you would like to hear from your loved one, your spouse. Now, here's another example. People with chronic disease can be described as A. Inevitably in pain B. Always grouchy C. Never able to walk and D. Needing more assistance. Well, you can hopefully see what I was trying to show you there. Can we really say that these people are always grouchy or inevitably in pain or never able to walk? Of course not. The correct answer is D, needing more assistance. Now, what about unfamiliar words? You know, some multiple choice questions are phrased using words that you have never heard of or never seen. They may be even made up words. They're, they don't even exist. And then most students taking a test, they freak out when they see these words and they decide to guess at the answer. However, this is another test of your deductive reasoning. I mean, if you ignore the strange word, does the question still make sense? Can you answer the question without even knowing what the word means. Who cares if you know what the word means or not? Let's look at this. You're treating a patient with Coop's disease. When comparing cotylenol and bitylenol, which of the following would be the most appropriate intervention for this patient? Cotylenol is more appropriate. Bitylenol is more appropriate. Bitylenol is not as appropriate. Or both A and B. Okay, well, again, it requires more deductive reasoning. So look at the clues in the scenario that has been given to you. You don't even know what Coop's disease is. You've never heard of cotylenol or bitylenol. All of the above are made up words. You know what? It doesn't matter. So you've got A, cotylenol is more appropriate. B, bitylenol is more appropriate. C, bitylenol is not as appropriate. And uh, D, both A and B. Well, the answer can't be D because you're asked to choose between either cotylenol or bitylenol. The answer can't be A or C because they say the very same thing. So that only leaves B as a correct answer, even though you have no idea what Coop's disease is. There's no need to freak out when you see unfamiliar terms. 
the more complex question asks you to prioritize the answers in some order. Most important, best, last, first, initial, etc. Use deductive reasoning. Also use your content knowledge and compare only the answers that are given to you. All right, now we start to look at true false questions. A true, uh, you know, choose true unless you know the statement is false. Because for a statement to be true, everything about the statement must be true. Be careful when a statement has a negative such as not, do not, or in, kind of like infrequent, and un, kind of like unfriendly. A negative can completely change the meaning of the statement. Now, if a statement has two negatives, cross out both the negatives. This will make it easier for you to understand the statement. So, like, it is never not a good idea to serve the people. Cross out never not. And then absolute statements are usually false. Absolute statements include words such as all, every, never, no, you know, it's kind of like dogs are never bold. I mean, bald. Well, I don't know that, but I can probably say not, you know, every single dog has hair. I'm sure that there are probably some bald dogs out there. And then qualified statements are usually true. Qualified statements include terms such as some, most, sometimes, rarely. Let's change that part. Some dogs are bald. Well, that sounds a whole lot better than dogs are never bald. So, it is never not a bad idea to sleep late. You answer, you know, you're kind of looking like true false questions. People in the Middle Ages were always short. Some of the Shawnee Indians were astrologers. All of the students have a GPA over 2.5. None of the scientists believe in God. So it kind of gives you those absolutes. Now on matching tests, read all the items in both columns before making any matches. Start by making matches about which you are sure of. And then cross out items in both columns as you make your matches. Make your best guess for the remaining items unless there is a penalty for guessing. Now, completion test. Read the item and think about what's missing. Write an answer that logically completes the item. Be sure your answer fits the item grammatically. Use the length of the line as a clue to the length of the answer unless the length of the blank is the same for all answers, then that won't be true. After you write the answer, then read the entire answer to make sure that it makes sense. So examples of fill in the blank. There were too many people coming into the colony and there was not enough blank, which led to many issues. Another one would be supplies will last far into the blank due to the advances in exploration and production. Another one is there were no identified problems that would alter blank recommendations. So that's really it, my friends. That's how you take a test. And I went over all types of test questions. So by taking the National Registry written exam for a medic, it is usually going to be multiple choice questions. So I hope that this helped you out a little bit, and I encourage you, we went pretty fast, so I would rewatch it again. I would rewatch it as many times as I need to, to make sure that you understand how to take a test question. So thank you guys so very much for letting me help you just a little bit on test taking strategies. And please be sure to go to my website, www.johnperrier.com. 
and my company is John Perrier EMSCE and it is an LLC and I am John Perrier and I am passionate about educating and helping people fulfill their calling and to fulfill their destiny of being a public servant and being able to make a difference in people's lives. So God bless you. If you need anything, please don't hesitate to contact me.